so I'm a Brooklyn kid who gets into music and art in 78. Uh, and I don't know how quickly I met Barney, but I certainly, I fell in with the musicians quickly. And when I say musicians, you know, music and art was classical music and the, the visual arts, sculpture and painting. And, and ironically, the bands, the student bands, were almost always made up of the, the art students. To make a long story short, by the time I got to music and art, punk music has come along. The idea of punk is something that has an energy and an aggressiveness, um, a cultural specificity that's uh, strong enough, attractive enough to rival all the great black music that was otherwise basically dominating New York City in that time, as everyone knows. And, you know, hip-hop was inventing itself, and funk and disco and soul were, you know, uh, were the dominant things you'd hear uh, in the neighborhoods. And then again, there was also, you know, there was rock and roll, but that was kind of my parents' music. I grew up in a home where uh, the Beatles and Eric Clapton couldn't really be mine because they were already my mom and dad's. Punk was this beacon. It said, here's something of your own, kid. And at the same time, I was shifting from these black and Hispanic dominated public schools I'd been in uh, to the extremely diverse, wonderfully egalitarian scene at music and art. But it was one where there were a lot of people who looked like me all of a sudden. So I felt like maybe I could throng with my, you know, awkward white milieu and we could have punk music and I would be, I would be, you know, home in a way. Uh, I was very eager to hang out with kids who were just gone from being nerdy to realizing they could buy a leather jacket and be nerdy but with a leather jacket. Right, and so Barney was nominally in this gang, but then again, he was doing this thing that was perverse, familiar, uh, exciting, um, ludicrous, which is all he wanted to think about was disco and funk. And I responded to it instantly because his attraction and familiarity uh, beckoned to my own gnarled up feeling about, you know, oh, this music is mine, it isn't mine, it's the music of my neighborhood, it's, it's the music in my world. So Barney, I, I, I got it and I, and I thought it was clever and, and um, resourceful and, uh, and I, we hit it off and I thought, uh, right, that's it, you make it, make it your own. There were a lot of uh, bands at Music and Art and um, some of them had some ambition and credibility and some of them were kind of fly by night. They were just, you know, they were just so you could be in a band. Miller, 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 and Sloan were weirdly pre-professional. They like knew what their lineup was, their, their name. I mean, first of all, they weren't changing their name every five minutes. Their name stayed the same. Their lineup stayed the same. They had an idea, um, you know, to be the, the white funk band. Uh, they could play their instruments and there was, they were like a little bit driven to make something happen, which was very exciting because you thought, wait, I guess this is how it happens. One of these groups of your idiot friends suddenly declares themselves and records and someone notices them or lets them open a show for, you know, the clash or whatever happens. And, well, okay, why not? This is it. I mean, the, the, stat, the state of uh, ambition was very... Um, peculiar in that time and place because what had just happened in New York City was that people like uh, Talking Heads and and television, you know, art school kids kind of dressing up, playing in a apparently marginal scene and then becoming this dominant and really, you know, amazing cultural phenomenon. And um, or also, you know, bands that felt literally felt like a high school band, like the Ramones, had changed the world just ahead of, you know, our generation. So this idea that by being ludicrous, you might also suddenly be suddenly the Ramones or whatever, you know, uh, that this had happened and this was the these were the stages where this had occurred. Um, you know, those bands had just recently graduated. They were all on labels. They'd stopped playing the little club and they were playing you know, middle-sized theaters or going on tour. And so that kind of left CBGB and other places uh, vacant for the, for the high school kids. We like sort of took over, we moved in. And uh, 
Miller, 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 and Sloan seemed to have a clue, you know? And they had, you know, they had a single. They had a, they had a, we, everyone knew what their single was, right? Um, it could get stuck in your head. The idea of being in New York City and being um, in some way in training to inherit an artistic mantle was something we were all embarrassed by and yet completely passionate about at the same time. So maybe we're there to do the next thing, right? Um, at the same time, punk and just teenage disaffection, teenage, uh, you know, sullenness made it very embarrassing to acknowledge any kind of ambition. And, you know, we were at Music and Art, in fact, in the same era, the exact same era, that the film Fame came out. So that film was sort of slightly about your own high school when it came out. And we were there in high school. Fame comes out. We all found it hideously, uh, you know, um, corny and, and broad, and, and we, would, we wouldn't openly identify with that kind of thing. But at the same time, the idea that we were at the talent school was, you couldn't completely deny it. Well, Barney and Mikey and Danny, they had found a way to make being unembarrassed about wanting it perfectly cool, perfectly viable and acceptable. They were uh, able to look you in the eye and say, yeah, we're going to do this and this and this and this and this, and then we'll be, you know, we'll be a band. And have it not be, you know, they didn't have to, like, smash their guitars and break up and change their band's name every five minutes to remain viable as sullen teenagers. Somehow, their ambition was acceptable to all of us. We all, they were like, you go do that for us. You know, it was like, we weren't quite ready to stop being, um, uh, you know, half-assed, but we were ready for them to, 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 to do it for us. And uh, so every little triumph of theirs seemed on behalf of the whole gang. And it, I think specifically that everyone else was in a punk band and they were doing this like white funk made it non-rivalrous. I knew Barney uh, most of all. He and I, he was one year ahead of me and we really, we hit it off. And Barney for me was a friend who, it, it wasn't only about music or, or about New York City or, or our high school experience. Just, I remember him as someone who had this voracious, informal kind of enthusiasm for cultural stuff. I remember watching 2001 with him. They had a home video of it. You know, I felt so early, it felt to me like, how could you have a copy of 2001 in your house? And he'd obviously memorized the film and we were watching it together and he was just talking through all the scenes and saying what he liked. And I, you know, it's, it's emblematic for me, an early encounter with someone my own age who had that kind of devotion to cultural stuff. And I, and I loved Mikey. You know, Mikey was like a irresistible kind of mascot for kids at high, in high school who were a little older than, than, than he was. Of course, he was a hundred times cooler than any of us, but you could still somehow patronize Mikey because he was younger. Blake was a very uh, seductive, romantic figure to me. He was a very cool older kid. He was like a real artist. And he, of course, he, let the, he lent the band a certain fascination for being the, you know, the one who wasn't the brother. Danny had, you know, he was already out of high school by the time I got to know these guys. And in the family dynamics of the band, there was very much, you know, when I say that it, their ambition was okay, it was cool, somehow they like had a workaround to the problem of it being embarrassing to actually want to succeed. Part of it was they all blamed it on Danny. So that was the way Mikey and Barney could still seem to be kind of like um, just having fun, but yet this, this professional framework for the band, this like, we're going to really succeed thing could still be going. It was because Danny was insisting that they, they, they take it all very seriously. I remember very specifically when, you know, uh, when, when, when this was going to be pressed, you know, the decisions about the font and, you know, and, and the, des the design of the thing. And then when, you know, when we were waiting for it to come back and the, when it did come back, when it, when the record had been pressed, um, you know, so I was somehow, this, this happened right around the time that I was probably most attentive to all the little developments with the, the band. I mean, even just seeing the, 
the phone number, which is the fam was the family phone number. The whole sort of slightly professional aura, but then you kind of know that this is just his mom's phone number. I, I this this artifact just brings me right back to that. You know, the tragic thing about so many friendships from this kind of part of your life is you suddenly stop and you don't know why you stopped or you're, you, you know, you're sort of like, what, what, what happened? I was, I would go to any Miller, Miller, Miller and Sloan show and then suddenly I never went to one again. You know, it's like, and you know, you try to keep in touch, but what, like, what was my last contact with them? What was the last news I had of them? I can't remember. The endings become so lost in time. But they stayed in your imagination. Oh, of course, absolutely. Well, especially once I began to realize how all that stuff I'd locked in a box was turbulent for me, was very important to me, and that I was wanting to write about it and process it through my, you know, these images and these memories through stories that I was going to tell. So I began, I began writing about them. I mean, I think I did it in, I think I've at this point found three or four different public occasions. There's the piece about the clash, which is what I, where I think I broke the seal. And then I worked them into the manuscript that I was working on in that period uh, for many years uh, into Fortress of Solitude. Um, and then I wrote about them in a piece about my history of my own learning to dance. Because in many ways I learned to dance or I claimed dancing as something that could be mine, could belong to me. So I, I write about learning to dance at, at Miller, Miller, Miller and Sloan shows. They played our high school once. They played the high school auditorium and, I, and, I, and everyone was seated because it was the high school auditorium and I was kind of the only person dancing. It was like, I'd me I think I read about this in the piece, I measured this distance. I sort of said, well, I'm not just watching and I'm not in the band, I'm sort of somewhere in between. Um, it was a, one of those moments when you, you know, you should be hor horrendously embarrassed, but somehow it, you, you become stirring to yourself. You know, the idea of, of making some claim in, in a public way. Did, but did you think they would go further? Yes, oh God, I was always waiting. I, oh, part of me was always waiting, just thinking, they just, they did it. They came up with a name, an idea. They're great to listen to. That, you know, uh, it was like checking my watch. When am, when, when am I going to hear about them from somewhere else? Like, when are they going to be on the radio or on MTV? And I'm going to have to say to people, I knew them when, and they're going to sort of blow me off. I mean, I'd had that experience with the Beastie Boys because I went to summer camp with Adam Yauch, and they were, they seemed like the most ludicrous joke of a band. We never took them seriously at first. And so when they got really big, and then I was in California, and, uh, you know, they weren't the horse you would have bet on. You would have bet on Miller, 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 and Sloan. Uh, but so when the Beasties got big, I had to, you know, it was very wearisome to be the one who's like, I knew them, and people are just like, whatever, dude, you know, they're big. Uh, go away. But I expected, I always expected that I was going to have to, you know, tug on people's sleeve and say, I really, really was friends with Miller, 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 and Sloan. I'm not joking. I, I like, totally hung out with them uh, because I, I saw them as famous already. They'd manifested it so naturally. Oh, baby, are you the key to my heart? With all the love we share, I know we'll never part. When there's a word. The Miller brothers may have been guilty, ironically, of loving soul too well. Because they were, you know, their ballads, they were really into Teddy Pendergrass. They were really, you know, able to look past the slick production of like Philly Soul and the, the awkward kind of Love God vibe that you got from someone like Barry White and hear the musical genius of that stuff. And so they were sinking a lot of their stock into really stuff that really only black people listen to. When I listen to those attempts now, I hear, you know, I hear the, wow, they were well before any white kid, even the ones who were sort of a little bit into George Clinton because George Clinton was kind of funky and dirty and druggy. Very, very few white kids, especially high school age, were able to shed their embarrassment enough to hear like the genius of a Teddy Pendergrass bedroom ballad. But somehow Mikey and Barney were actually into that. And if anything, they almost were too, way too ahead of, 
uh, the white embrace of black music. You know, it was going to be a long time before uh, that could be. You know, that could be cool. If you told me or any of my friends that when we were older we would unironically embrace music like that, it would have been like, you have the wrong person. You know, you're so, that's so, that stuff is like cheese. It's just, I can't, it could never work. And they heard it. They were not, they, somehow they had thrown the frameworks away.